Thank you very much, Shamala. Where did you get all this? I didn't send you this. <laughs> uh, thank you, Sundar. Thank you, Vinod, uh, for getting me here. What I, what I propose to do uh, in the course of the next two, three, uh, two hours is to go into the very basic question uh, of sustainable urbanization. Uh, when I received uh, Sundar's phone call asking me if I could deliver a lecture, what the thought that I had was that this question sustainable keeps coming again and again, uh, giving me the impression that people do think that, the urban, that urbanization and the way it is occurring in India is not sustainable. There are some fear, there are some apprehensions that the way uh, India and the world are facing urbanization, urbanization challenges, there's something wrong with it, and we need to bring in some kind of a correction. I thought I'll, I'll deal with this issue uh, quite extensively, uh, as much as I can, uh, see whether our fears are genuine fears, or whether they are really born out of our wrong understanding of the issues involved, um, and then try to enter into uh, a second uh, issue, which is to what extent, if at all, if at all our fears are genuine, then the question arises to what extent the, the whole urban policy, urbanization, whether these are policy induced or whether we are on the right path but there's something wrong with the way we perceive urbanization. That would be the second question that I would try and deal with. And finally, uh, we'll look at the, some of the major programs that the government of India have initiated and see whether they would bring about some kind of sustainability in the whole process of urbanization, in the whole phenomenon of urbanization. Whether they would bring, whether they would lead to, in due course of time, long-run sustainability as part of the urbanization is concerned. So these are the three things that I propose to deal with in the course of the next two hours or so. What I have done is that I have a PowerPoint, but I would use it sparingly, and use it only when there are numbers involved. But otherwise, it would be so much better to, to talk face to face and really get your feel as to why do you feel urbanization and the way it is happening is not on the right path. Um, the starting point or the first proposition that I wish to make is that urbanization, in the sense that more and more people live in urban areas, is perhaps one of the biggest transformations that the world has ever seen. From a time when only 3% of people used to live in urban areas, that was of course a long, long time ago, the world is already half urban. 50.6% of people were living in urban areas in 2010. That was the last count that we had from the United Nations. We, have, we do not have any example in the world that any country has faced de-urbanization of any sort. Cities rise and fall. But if you look at the, at the aggregate level, you will not find any example anywhere that there has been de-urbanization of any kind anywhere. Then the question obviously is that where are the fears? What is wrong with it? It is happening. It is happening all the time. Then where are the applications, the general tenor being that is not safe? Just use two or three slides here. Does the fear arise from the fact that the pace of urbanization, the speed at which it is happening? is too fast? Should that be slowed down in any way? Uh, is this causing apprehensions of any kind in our minds? That is, we get it. That one. The second issue that we, I think, need to consider is, are the numbers, the huge numbers that we deal with, are these a matter of concern? Globally, there are 3.5 billion people who live in urban areas. Is that a matter of concern? Numbers? 
not being able not being able to handle them, or is the distribution of urban population among different sizes of settlements is that issue? You go to Delhi, you you, you live in Delhi or in Mumbai or Bangalore and so on and so forth, and people say, oh, this place is becoming impossible to live in. Why is that? What is what is behind our mind? Is the size the problem? Or you go to a small city, people will say it's not a place worth living in. Anyway. So either you go to a small town or a big town, people do see that there's a problem here. So is the size distribution, the way it is distributed, the urban population distributed among sizes of, uh, uh, of uh, centers of different sizes, is that issue? Should we begin to look at it a little more carefully? Or is it the inability of the global community to be able to provide housing, infrastructure, and services to such large numbers? And that really is the, what goes on at the, at the back of our mind, is that issue. And do the urban consume, I think, being in Kelly and being uh, probably that question might arise, do the urbans in any way consume too much compared with the non urbans Is it the reason that we find the current level or the pace of urbanization unacceptable, that we consume far more than our counterparts in non urbans Or is it a question of resources? Does the world economy have the money needed to adequately sustain 3.5 million people are in residents right now, and also growing at a rate of about 2.5% per annum. Is that, the, is that the issue? Or does it really, or does unsustainability stem from the kinds of policies the countries pursue in dealing with urbanization? And I think we will get into that question a little more in detail. And these issues will form the subject of this morning's session. Just one word. Interrupt me any time that you like. It won't disturb me for. Don't wait for the question until the very end. Just ask whenever you feel like. Let's see the, this phenomenon and the process of urbanization both worldwide and in India. Some numbers. Um, if you look at the first column, the world from 1.74 billion to about 3.49 billion in 2010. That within a matter of 30 years, the world's total urban population doubled from 1.74 to 3.49, exactly doubling. When you look at the, the developing countries part, it has not only doubled, but it has risen by 2.5%, from about a billion or 995 million has gone up to 2.7 million, 2.5 times. And when you look at the level, and this is what I was mentioning, that the world is already half urban, you will find from about 39% in 1980, the world has become 50%. Developing countries are racing up, it's already 45%. What is interesting is by the year 2050, the developing countries would have caught up with the developed world in terms of the levels of urbanization, both there would be virtually no difference between the developing country, between developing countries as a group and the developed countries when it comes to levels of urbanization. Don't, don't write these down. I'm sure that the PowerPoint would be given out as a, as a handout or something also. Just look at these numbers. That's the way we have been urbanizing. This is the question that always arises, the pace the pace at which the, global, glo the world is urbanizing and the, and the developing countries are urbanizing. If you look at this, uh, uh, you will find that there has been, in recent decades, in recent years, the pace has been tapering off. From about two point, globally, from about 2.69, which was a high in, during 1985-1990, it has now come down to close to 2%, 1.198%. When you look at the developing countries, you would find a similar trend. The world is not urbanizing as fast as it was 
in the early 1990s, not urbanizing, it is slowing down. And part of the slowing down is, you, if you look into the details, you will find that the growth rate which is a, of urban population, which is a function of three or four factors, where the natural growth rate is declining worldwide. And that has contributed to the declining rate of urbanization, as, as, uh, uh, as, you, as you see from the table. You will find similar trends in India. We'll come to the Indian figures in a few minutes. Uh, this is just a graph showing different parts. We not, may not read. This is a very interesting sort of uh, table. Find that in 1950, there were only two cities in the world which had population of 10 million plus, just two. And that was New York and Tokyo. Today, in 2010, there are 19 cities which have 10 million population plus. The interesting part is that of these 19 million, of these 19 cities, there is only one addition, that is Osaka, uh, in, uh, which has also become a 10 million plus city, all other cities are in the developing countries. So developing countries are facing a very different way of urbanizing, that large cities are increasing in numbers. 10 million cities and so on and so forth, they're increasing, while the numbers of such large cities is almost over, that phase is almost over in the developed part of the, of the world. And even if you see the projections up to 2025, I think there is only one or two cities like Osaka and I think Paris might become a 10 million city in the year 2025, but there are serious doubts about that also. The interesting part about this table is that uh, virtually no, there's no experience of any kind anywhere how to manage such large agglomerations how to feed them, how to bring water, how to deal with their waste, how to ensure that people are mobile in those cities. It is virtually no experience of any kind. There are no precedents anywhere. So every city, in a sense, is trying to discover how to manage such large agglomerations. And part of the problem that we see in our systems, how do we deal with them, arise because there are no precedents of any kind. Either in the developed world, there are only two examples or all in the developing world, part of the problem arises. I might also uh, invoke here that um, if you look at the policies worldwide, you will find a very cautious kind of policy here, which have been saying that the cost of running such cities rise disproportionately. Um, in fact, that was the, one of the most favorite subjects of research in 60s and 70s used to be, whether there was an optimal size of a city, where that cutoff point, that 4 million, 5 million, beyond which costs begin to rise disproportionately or, or not, or whether we should stop chasing this word optimal size. There were a lot of work both in India as well as, uh, as uh, outside. If you see the, I think it's the fourth five-year plan. Half, half of you would not have been born at that time, um, uh, which says that cost of dealing with large cities is very high. And part of the policies that India has followed is stemmed really from that one single sentence, that cost of maintaining these cities is very high. And all the programs that were taken up in India in the early 70s and early 80s, really followed that particular sentence. And emphasis on small cities, emphasis on intermediate cities, really came out of that kind of a policy statement. Um, in, in fact, if I recall right, there used to be um, a study which would test out a U-shaped curve, a cost curve. And the hypothesis used to be their costs are very high in very small cities. They decline as the city size increases, but then begins to rise again after a certain point. 
And that really led to the thesis of optimal, that there is an optimal size that were disproved by subsequent works and so on and so forth. Let's see where are we as far as India is concerned. India is a low urbanized country, even today. Just about 31 percent. Uh, I think we still haven't come out of the, the old maxim that India lives in villages. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think that must be the attraction of both Lina and Sundar. That <laughs> that <laughs> the, I think we still haven't come out of the old maxim that India lives in villages, um, and um, um, so uh, you, you you find this reflected in these figures. Uh, we in 2011 we were just about 31.2 percent, uh, 377 million people. It's true that we have the second largest urban system in the world uh, after China. 377 million is not the population, even the total population of the next largest country, uh, even, even that is not there. What is important is the last one, that our annual exponential population growth rate is now 2.7. It had been declining but there has been a slight retrieval of the growth rate in the decade of 2001 to 2011. It had started declining, but it showed a slight rise once again in the last decade. Uh, attributed, uh, as we, as some of us do with economics background, attributing it to the open economy, including GDP and so on and so forth, which really come out of the, um, of, of, uh, uh, the recent, uh, recent events and very close connection. You will also find some of these charts where, particularly this one, showing that that is the way the rural population is declining and that is the way the urban is increasing. And if you see this graph, it shows when would India become 50% urban. And according to the straight line kind of projections, Somewhere in 19, uh, 2041, 2042, India should become urban at the current rates of urban population growth. I do not know whether we should uh, speed up the process of becoming urban as is the fashion in a number of countries, that that becomes your goal. How fast or how soon can we become 50% urban? or whether we should, for whatever reasons, well, let's not uh, hurry it up. That's a doomed day and let's slow down our process of urbanization. It really all depends on how one, one really looks at it. It's just a, uh, a, a table that really shows how strongly our economy and urbanization processes are involved. Um, the second one is that is how our urban share of GDP has been behaving. Uh, with our populations shown in the previous table, and if you combine these two, you will show that the GDP has been slowly rising up, giving us the indication that urban areas are more productive compared to their rural parts. And it is this productivity differential between the rural and the urban that really draws people to our cities. That would be a very straight kind of a, a conclusion from this, from this table if we exclude all other variables from our, from our uh, calculus. So you will, you will find that there's a very close connection and these are a few regressions that show how strongly the economy and urbanization tend to go together. Raising once again the first question that I raised, if, that is, if there is some kind of an inevitability about urbanization, and that is what the world experience shows, and if there are such strong links between urbanization and economic growth, why the hell are we worried about it? Why do we raise the issue that is it sustainable or not? Economy is doing well. There are very close connections between the two. And this seems to be a global, a global phenomenon everywhere urban, uh, urban population is increasing. Just once again, as an aside, 
I do not know whether you have had lectures in China. Uh, <clears throat> you will find that uh, if you read the Chinese urbanization, which is very interesting, in the China even today, uh, migration is regulated. I will not say it is controlled as it used to be, but it's somewhat regulated. Uh, you are registered in a commune even today. Uh, so even if you are migrate, migrating, your registration is still back in the commune and not necessarily in, uh, in Beijing or Shanghai or Tianjin and so on so forth. Work. During the period when China regulated its migration, controlled its migration, that you could not come to urban areas, accepting with permission of the government. And those conditions were laid down. You could migrate, for example, to Beijing or Shanghai or Tianjin only upon fulfillment of certain conditions, these being admissions in Beijing University or Shanghai University, or getting married. And I think there was one more which I'm forgetting. Even during that strictly controlled migration, when the a first census was held after 1957 in China in 1982, suddenly they discovered there had been a lot of migration, which was taking place despite all the restrictions that the Chinese government was imposing upon them. So that was happening even in China. Um, other countries have also tried it, like Indonesia, where uh, you could not come to the main island that was Java, but you could sort of go to smaller ones. That was in the 1970s. Malaysia also tried it in a, in a very weak form. Nowhere these things have functioned. Going back, to raising the same, same issue that if there is inevitability about it, it is an unstoppable phenomenon, then why the hell do we raise this issue of sustainability? Then there lies some kind of a break in our thinking that while urbanization is taking place, a very large proportion of people are without basic services, a very large proportion. And there is a lot of poverty. But the question that arises is that, well, if urbanization is such a good thing, why would it not begin to impact particularly on poverty issues? If your GDP and and uh, urbanization is so closely linked. Why is it that urbanized, the, the poverty is so widespread and poverty is increasing in India, uh, in India's uh, areas until the uh, Abhijit Sen is not here, but uh, you know he was here yesterday. But those figures on poverty are still highly contentious. But whatever these are, have a look at them. <coughs> The red one shows the, the, the urban numbers. You'll find that the number of the urban poor has been increasing. 60 million in 73, 71 million 83, 76 million 80.8, and 76.5. There's a drop in 2009, 2010. But as I said, Planning Commission is um, Unsure whether these are the right figures or these are the wrong figures. I'm sure all of you would have read the debate about six, four months back, the increase 32 uh, debate, which is the cut of crime. Um, when you contrast it with the rural poverty figures, which are not here, but if you contrast it with the combined figures, they've been declining. And that gives rise to some kind of a doubt that the way urbanization is taking place is not distributing the fruits of growth equitably. So this, uh, this headcount ratio percentage uh, out of the total population, 25.7% will be? Below the poverty line. And you, know the, and you know the below the poverty line really means in urban areas, 2,100 ca 2, calories. In the rural areas, money equivalent of 2,100 is a poverty cutoff. In urban, 2,400 calories, that is the cutoff uh, in, um, in the rural area. That is, uh, so this head count is really that. Number of people who do not have the money income to buy 2,100 calories in urban areas, that is the cutoff point. And in the combined one, of course, both rural and urban, yeah. but if you look at the urban, 
60 million people do not really earn enough to be able to buy 2,000 mutton cattle. This is true. Yes. This definition incidentally has been the same with minor modifications of estate adjustment, price levels, and so on and so forth. But right from 1973, when the first attempt to estimate was made, uh, following down the paragraph and so on and so forth. This is the first indication, uh, or the first doubt that gives that that is so. Further probing of these poverty figures will show that poverty in urban areas is declining at a slower rate, wherever it has, uh, or, or uh, no, it's showing at, yeah, sorry. If you see the last column in the, in the top table, please, that urban, um, the, uh, the, the, let me see if I can adjust it. The numbers are rising in the urban, but declining in rural and declining in the total. Making the same point again, that the urban area, the way it is taking place, there are poverty around. The way it is, it's not, it is not addressing issues of poverty. The way it is happening. And many um, scholars very clearly point out that, look, it's the poor people who come from the rural areas, and they just settle down in, 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 uh, in this place leading to poverty and so on and so I'm not, I'm not showing to you some other tables uh, uh, which deal with the levels of deprivation in terms of water, in terms of uh, how the speed of mobility or the mobility has slowed down over the years, um, or uh, uh, solid waste not being collected. Those are all symptoms of the manifestations that we keep hearing that, look, you can't even supply water. Um, it comes for one hour or it comes for two hours. And that really, uh, if I talk to my family with, uh, with my wife, uh, her responsibility is, what, what are you people doing? I mean, uh, you talk about large cities being so productive, but they may be productive in your sense, but they're certainly not productive when it comes to dealing with the household. Uh, not not having water or enough water or electricity. So all, all those, I'm not showing those those numbers uh, which are which are available everywhere. But then the question obviously is that uh, uh, the uh, where where is the unsust unsustainability there? Oh, oh. Yes, that some people arguing that uh, it is uh, unsustainable because it leaves out a very large section of urban population without access to shelter, without access to services, without access to infrastructure. A section of, it leaves out a section of urban population below the poverty line, exposed to risks, and who those who bear a disproportionately high cost of environmental degradation. This is the kind of a conclusion that is often fleshed out whenever we raise issues of sustainability, that how can you call this a sustainable phenomenon. Uh, uh, more, more concepts are expressed in this way, that there are resource depletion, such as groundwater, fuel, wood, arable land. There's lots of figures coming out of Terry and Temp, coming out of other, other organizations. Uh, people do talk about very unrealistic 